or maybe you'll get rain in the future. We always pray for rain. So let's let's give thanks. Holy God, we are grateful to be gathered read your word. May it speak to us, giving us uh, new hopes and new joy in your in your presence through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at uh, John 4, uh, verse uh, 43 to the end of chapter 6. So we're going to be looking at one of the most interesting chapters in all of John. Just a okay, show off. Thanks. Six. If you want to. Right. All right. So we'll, yeah. In, in a second, if you have a comments or questions, please raise your hand and we'll uh, kind of turn to you. All right. Um, so this morning, let's start by looking at John 4, uh, 43 to the end of the chapter. And it's the story of an official who we don't know if he works for the Romans or if he works for King Herod Antipas, who you recall uh, beheaded John the Baptist. But he gets wind that Jesus is in Cana. Now, Jesus has already done something spectacular in Cana, right? He's turned water into wine. And so this royal official goes from his hometown of Capernaum. And uh, Capernaum is on the north part of the Sea of Galilee. So it's about 22 miles from Capernaum to, uh, from Capernaum to Cana. And those of you who've been to Israel know what short distances we're, we're talking about. Uh, for instance, most American tourists, when they go to Israel, just usually get a hotel in Jerusalem, and then they take day trips uh, all across the country, and it's it's easy. So to go from, say, Jerusalem to Capernaum, the north part of the Sea of Galilee, is about an hour or so. So these are short distances. So this, this official comes to Jesus, and he asks that Jesus would heal his son. Now, those of you who are aware, this story is also found in the uh, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a little bit different though, told a little bit differently. In the synoptics, it's the official's servant. In John, it's his son. And so uh, Jesus seems exasperated. If you look at the uh, text, uh, Jesus says something that's kind of interesting. Uh, verse 48, he says, none of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders. And I wonder if Jesus is saying that with a bit of exasperation. You know, unless I do something spectacular here, nobody's going to believe me. Uh, we're going to see in chapter six that even when he does something spectacular, there's easily misunderstood. All right. So Jesus says, nevertheless, uh, your son will be healed. And guess what? They figure out after going back to Capernaum that at the moment that Jesus spoke, that the son is healed. And this is an example of the Gospels of what I call long distance healings. You know, uh, in Luke 7, uh, this is a, a Roman official. It's his servant that's uh, sick. And, and the, the Roman official says to Jesus, uh, just say the word and he'll be healed. I'm not worthy to have you come under my house. Here, the royal official goes to Cana and asks Jesus, and so 22 miles away, the, the son is being healed simultaneously. But in both stories, whether it's Luke 7 or, or John uh, 4, it's a long distance healing. And uh, so it really raises the ante of Jesus' ability to heal. It's not true that Jesus has to lay hands on someone, or it's not true that the person being healed has to evidence faith. We'll see in a moment another example where it's not so much that the person has faith, rather the miracle engenders faith, or it creates faith. I mean, how much faith did Lazarus have? You know, it's not that. It's, it's rather that the miracle engenders faith. So it's not always true to say, unless people have faith, then Jesus can't do anything. That, that's simply not true biblically. The sound may not be the one that was being requested. Exactly. And in fact, we'll see the next story, the healing at the pool, 
It's a very ambiguous response to Jesus healing. So in that case, John says this was his second miracle. Now, we've already known from previous chapters that when he went to Jerusalem in chapter two, he did a numerous other miracles. But the, what John means by that is these are the ones I'm going to narrate. This is the second sign I'm going to narrate. So that gets us to the end of four. Does anybody have any comments or questions about this particular story? It, it is surprising that it's healing at a distance. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. All right. Chapter five is such an interesting story because you have a man who's been ill for 38 years. And for some reason, people gather around this pool, the, the sheep's gate, they call it, or Bethesda. Uh, by the way, Bethesda is the source of the name of the hospital in the city, right? It's, it's the house of sheep, right? And uh, that's <laughs> literally what it means, house of sheep, yeah. So he's been sitting there for 38 years and he believes, and some others do believe, that you only get healed if you're first in when the water sort of moves, maybe like a spring from underneath or something like that. And, and you have to stop and ask yourself, is this a kind of a folk legend, you know, that uh, people believe that the water, when it's moving, then it's healing, but when it's not moving, it, it doesn't work. And now, uh, have any of y'all been lords in uh, France? Um, I've read a lot about, well, I read a book by Richard Rohr who went to Lourdes and actually he, he states that he had a kind of a healing experience at Lourdes. But there's all kinds of folk tales about what and how you're healed at Lourdes. You know, this folk tale seems to be that if the water's moving, you can be healed. But this guy has not gotten in fast enough because he's, He's not able to move. He's paralyzed in some way. Now, those of you who remember your synoptic gospels, Jesus has another paralyzed man that's brought through the roof in Mark 2. Remember that? And he tells him to pick up his bed and walk. Well, notice what's happening here in, in chapter 5. This is a Sabbath. And we're going to get this again on the ninth, uh, ninth chapter. But he heals him on the Sabbath, right? And then more importantly, when he heals him, he tells him what? To pick up his bed and carry it or his pallet or something like that. And that constitutes work. <laughs> that constitutes working. And this is interesting. Uh, Jesus says to him, look, uh, you, you can pick up your pallet, you can walk. And then the man who is healed doesn't even know who Jesus is. He's asked later, right? Who did this? Well, I, I don't know. Some guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then they they got mad at him because he was lifting a pallet. So then the authorities start pressing him, right? And here's what the man uh, did. He said, the man left, verses fifth, this is verse 15. The man left and told the Jewish authorities that it was Jesus who healed him. So they began to persecute him because of what he's doing on the Sabbath. So think how ambiguous this miracle is. It, it's, he, doesn't know, he doesn't know who did it. And then he outs him. <laughs> right? He outs him. Now that, 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 and, and you almost get this self-interested idea that, look, they might be mad at me because I, I get on carrying something on the Sabbath. So they might kick me out of the synagogue or something like that. You know, well, well then that, that, that was Jesus. It wasn't me. And it reminds me of what? Adam? You know, I, I, it, she made me, you know. <laughs> so it's always deflecting blame. But but here, here's what I want to say is that when this story is over, they the net result, look at verse uh, 18. This saying made the Jewish authorities all the more determined to kill him. So <laughs> you have a miracle, the guy doesn't even know who did it. Then when he's pressed, he said, well, that was Jesus, you know, who did that. And then the net result is the Jewish authorities want to kill him. And that is the pattern you get so often in John. 
that the miracle is so ambiguous that a lot of people can see it. Yeah, he's now walking, he used to be paralyzed, but they don't connect the dots. This is a sign of God, you know. And um, it's very, very interesting how John wants to keep pressing the point that only those with eyes to see saw it as a sign. And lots of others saw it as a very negative thing. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? I find that incredibly interesting. That if you look at the New Testament, miracles are not, quote, self-authenticated. They, they don't automatically tell you what it is. They tell you something's happened here. Here's a guy who's paralyzed and he's walking, but he's blaming Jesus for making him carry the mat, and then they want to kill him. Think about that. <laughs> I mean, it's, so you wonder if Jesus, if, maybe that's why Jesus said, you, you, none of you will ever believe unless you see a miracle. Oh my God, here we go again. You know, you know, I'm going to do this miraculous sign and then nobody's going to get it and then they're going to try to kill it. So might that dissuade you from doing miracles? <laughs> well, at least it would call it into question the notion that uh, I hear, have heard many, many people say, if I could just have been there when Jesus did this. Kierkegaard, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, Danish theologian, 19th century, has a long series of uh, essays about the notion of, Warren Buck, uh, that if only I, I had been there. And Kierkegaard's point was, you would have had the same problem that we do at a distance. To see a, this as a sign of God requires something more than just, well, I've got a good camera here. I can catch this on film. George? I'm troubled by the statement that there was a multitude of sick people. And Jesus picked this one guy. Yeah. And that disturbs me. Yeah. And wonder, well, why didn't he just heal all of them? And, yeah. And that bothers me. Yeah. Well, George, since I had not received a direct communication about why, I will simply remain silent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Or to put it another way, I suspect that other people had died in Bethany the day that Lazarus died. Why Lazarus? You know. Anybody got a word from the Lord? Why? Why, why these and not a? Oh, Nicole. Well, I, in my opinion, I mean, this is just completely my opinion, but you know, the whole purpose of why it's not, you know, interpret, interpreting, you know, Jesus' miracles and uh -huh. why he did specific things, it's, I feel like it has a lot to do with trying to incite more promotion about the miracle because, again, it was on Sabbath and it yep. was not. Work. Right. Um, you know, and Jesus would say that, he, are you not going to say the child on the Sabbath just because it is the Sabbath? Or, um, so I feel like almost, yes, in a way, it's kind of disturbing why he would choose this yeah. person. Right. But I feel like it was more for the sake of the entire culmination of his ministry mm -hmm. to provoke that. Um, you know, change of the, the ordinary custom. It creates uh, a series of questions in people's minds. Absolutely. You know, how is it this guy who's been here 38 years that we've never seen walking? Is He's walking. I mean, that should have provoked something. By the way, when Jesus talks about the Sabbath, his argument is, is that God works on the Sabbath. You know, it's not as though God stops doing anything on the Sabbath, and, I, and I'm going to follow suit with what God's doing. Uh, this will get him into large trouble. Why? Because remember, what was the purpose of the Sabbath? The, the Sabbath is intended to relieve people of daily working as slaves, which they just experienced in Egypt, right? Where there's no break, that every day is the same, you know. You get one day where you don't do that. So it's for the renewal of human life. And when Jesus heals on the Sabbath, his argument is, what could be re more renewing for someone on the Sabbath than to have their limbs working again? 
or their sight to return to them, or et cetera. So healing and the Sabbath kind of go together, at least in Jesus' mind, right? But Frank, to tail on to what Nicole said, uh -huh. the, he knew that the Jews were looking for something. Yeah, pretext. So, yeah. And they do it all the way through John. You did that on the Sabbath, ergo, is bad. <laughs> but Frank, also, I wonder, like, how they were defining work. Right. Because in this story, he speaks to the guy. Well, That's surely right. in the temple, when they were on the Sabbath, they were speaking to people also. Mm -hmm. And so why, it, I mean, his speaking had a much more significant effect. That's right. But the person who picked up the mattress wasn't Jesus. No. And so how, I mean, it was but like he blamed they really Jesus. twisted the Yeah. The Remember, story. well, I, I wasn't doing this on my own. Jesus told right. us, you know. Yeah. I think we've got a different definition of the work. You know, we, we actually had a time clock or something. Something like that. You yeah. work every Sunday. And that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, as they say, you've been the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody that can do this stuff. You know, if I if I was if I was a Pharisee, Pharisees, whatever, I wouldn't want to mess with somebody. You would say, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. You might be able to do it the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, a miracle could turn into like cursing a fig tree. You could get, you uh, could be distracted too, right? Well, you, know, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, it was like the witches of Salem. Yes. Um, yeah. I would no more touch one of the witches than the. Yeah. They might be able to be a course, right? I teach you a course on a world religion to you, and you'd be amazed in all the world religions how ambiguous miracles are. Uh, I just taught a, a, several weeks on, on the Buddha, Siddhartha, and there were certain. Um, Buddhist monks, when they got together in the community, said that, you know, because of our meditating and stuff, we can do miraculous things. And the Buddha absolutely forbade it. He said, I, I do not want people to think that our movement is just about magic. You know what I mean? Uh, the morning come in. And, and so the Buddha forbade anything related to uh, healing stories or anything like that. Come in, come in. We're looking at uh, John 5. There you go. Welcome, sir. All right. We're looking at the story in John 5, 1 through uh, 18. And we're talking about the ambiguity of miracles, etc. So anyway, the Buddha said, we don't want to be uh, classified with magicians. You know, and... Uh, and you see this throughout other world religions, the, the fear that, oh, if, if this is magic or this could turn into what? Um, bad magic, <laughs> you know, that's going to hurt someone, right? That sort of thing. All right. So, the, so Jesus does what he does on the Sabbath because why? It's part of healing the human condition, right? So healing on the Sabbath is part of that rest and restoration that's promised for the Sabbath. Okay. Now, in verse 19, he then uh, is asked about his authority to do this. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus' authority is always a big question. Who says you can do this sort of thing? And by the way, uh, again, in world religions, one of the biggest questions in world religions is, well, who gave you that right to do what you're doing. By the way, world religions, the vast majority of them, the founders almost always will point to a sort of a transcendent experience they had. You know, God spoke to me from a burning bush. Uh, Muhammad, God spoke to me in a cave north of Mecca, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Jesus uh, here doesn't point to a mystical experience in John because why? From the moment Jesus shows up, he's experiencing God's glory. It's, it's not as though Jesus lives for a little while in the Gospel of John, and then he wakes up, you know, oh, well, this, I must be the Messiah. You know, it is, <laughs> it's rather 
from the moment he shows up, he, the, we saw his glory, you know, from the very beginning. So Jesus answered to the question of what authority you have to do. Very simple is this. Uh, I am doing what my father told me to do. And it's almost a, an apprentice, it, it, you know, the old notion of the son taking on the, the occupation of the father, you know, that sort of thing. So listen, this is in 519. So Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth, the son of man can do nothing on his own. He does only what he sees his father doing. What the father done, does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And he will show even greater things uh, to come. Okay. So at this point, Jesus' argument is, I'm just doing what my father told me. Now, that's going to create a lot of tension, right? Who are you <laughs> to say that, right? Which brings us to the witnesses to Jesus. That's starting in, in verse 530 to the end. Let me summarize 530 to the end of, of that chapter. Jesus says, I have four witnesses that what I'm doing is really God's will. Number one, the first witness is John the Baptist. He's a shining light that he spoke about with John the Baptist. Secondly, my signs, my works, my wonders point to who I am, my signs. Thirdly, he says, uh, God, my father, bears witness that what I'm doing is right. And the fourth is, strangely enough, are the Hebrew scriptures. And the Hebrew scriptures point to me, Moses points to me, and, and anticipates my doing this. So here it is. It is the signs, uh, John the Baptist, uh, God the Father, and the scriptures. And so in, in the Gospel of John, there's arguments about who has the right interpretation of scripture. I've often said that when Paul went into synagogues, what did he do? He had a Bible argument with him. It was an argument about what the Hebrew scriptures were anticipating. And when Paul read the Hebrew scriptures with Christological eyes, he saw something in them that his opponents didn't. So it's the same text, but Paul was reading it Christologically, right? And these people weren't. So that's the argument Jesus makes in this kind of long section. I don't think I want to read it because it's a little bit redundant and but that, that's the argument. Uh, the signs point to me. John the Baptist points to me. God the Father points to me. And the scriptures point to me. By the way, remember in Luke 24, Road to Emmaus, when Jesus is walking with Cleopas and his friend, they have a Bible lesson. Remember? Quote, he opened the scriptures to see the Hebrew scriptures with new eyes. By the way, uh, when we, I'm having uh, lunch with my good friend Harry Rosenfeld, who just retired from being the rabbi at uh, the Congregation of Albert uh, on Monday. And Harry and I are thinking about doing a lecture at the uh, Oasis in the spring on Jesus, how Jesus is seen by the Jewish community and how Jesus is seen by the Christian community. And ultimately, part of that discussion is going to be about how you see the scriptures of the Hebrew scriptures, do you see them with Christological eyes or not? I, I, he had me actually teach his confirmation class one time and uh, he was gonna be gone. He said, well, why don't you come teach it? And I said, well, what's it on? And he says, Isaiah 53. I said, you're kidding, right? <laughs> Isaiah 53, you know, the suffering servant, you know, we've seen him uh, bruised and marred for our transgression. I said, you know, Harry, you know what Isaiah 53 is about in the Christian community. He says, I said, well, you can say whatever you want. I'll clean it up to let the father. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not. I'll clean it up the next week. <laughs> Sorry. That's why I love Harry Rosenfeld. So we're going to do this Jesus from Jewish and Christian eyes. And part of it really is how do the scriptures of the Old Testament, how do you read those? You know? Jesus opens their eyes on the road to Emmaus. All right, now I, we've got enough time now to do chapter six, which is an unbelievable chapter 
an, a, a, an astonishing chapter and one of the best of the written of the chapters in the Gospel of John, unless you have some other thoughts. All right, so I am, I am almost in thinking that it's too long to read. Uh, but what, what we'll do is we'll read parts of it, okay? But let me just kind of set it up here. Uh, the Gospel of John sometimes jumps from hither to yon. The end of chapter 5, remember where he is. He's in Jerusalem, right? And then chapter 6 begins like this. After this, Jesus went across the lake of Galilee. What? And Peter will remember in the class I teach at UNM. That's called a literary C. In other words, there seems to be something missing. He, he's in Jerusalem. <laughs> and, and then suddenly, now they're crossing over the Sea of Galilee. Well, wait, how? You know, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of an abrupt switch of scenery, right? So he's at the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it turns out they go to a hill. And uh, if you go to Israel, they, what I sometimes call Jesus land, that they have these spots all over Israel. Here Jesus did X. That'll be ten dollars, you know, for you to come to this. Like for instance, you want to climb a really tall sycamore tree in Jericho. That'll be ten dollars. You know, so you know, so you have Jesus land all over Israel, and there's this beautiful hillside on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. But they have guess what? Grass, which is unusual in Israel because it's rocky and it reminds you of our environment a lot. Okay. So there's grass here, ten dollars. You can go over there, and he says he he uh, sees these people. There's a lot of folks who later be said that there are five thousand men. Now, how many women and children? It, it doesn't tell us. And uh, he asked Philip, "Well, listen, uh, can you get some bread for him?" He's testing him, and of course, Philip says, "We don't have enough money to feed all these folks." And then Andrew comes up with this little boy who's got uh, what five loaves of bread and two fish. Right, and he says, "Make them sit down." He gives thanks, and this is uh, how it, it uh, works. He says, "So all the people sat down." Verse ten: There were about five thousand men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. And he did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. And when they were all full, he says, "Gather up the pieces," and they have twelve baskets of bread. The fish was all eaten because. Fish is good, you know, and you won't have that. So uh, you know that there are two miracles that are in all four Gospels. This one and the resurrection. And that's the only two miracles you'll find in all four Gospels. The, quote, multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, right? And, and all kinds of people, by the way, have tried to figure out some sort of rational explanation for this you know the most famous one was by the french writer Romeris, who said all the people who brought bread and fish for them they, they were you know secreting it away when jesus broke bread and gave thanks well that that made them you know, generous yeah. right so you know and uh, that it's pretty similar to the explanation of jesus walking on the water he knew where the rocks were mm -hmm. they were kind of the same sort of thing i i it's, kind of miraculous that he does this and people immediately see it as a sign by the way they see it as a sign of what that he is the prophet to come deuteronomy 18 the prophet who is to come and because they see him as the prophet to come look at verse uh, 15 jesus knew <laughs> that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force so he went off again to the hills by himself. Help me on that. What, what's going on, y'all think? They wanted to seize him by force and make him king. It's not the way kings are usually uh, enthroned, right? Uh, this is the bread maker, the fish maker. Let's make him king. And Jesus, in a moment, will say, look, what you like so much about what I did is that you ate your fill of bread. So, so he knows that, wait, this miracle can be so misconstrued that they're going to think that I'm going to make myself a king 
by their acclimation and they're just going to eat their fill. So right there in this ambiguity about this miracle, they seem to think it's a way to get what they want. Hey, can I, can I ask you what to the, whether it was a miracle, whether right. people shared? Right. I was thinking about your sermon mm -hmm. this morning mm -hmm. and maybe if they do take out their things and share, right. that would be also a miracle. It would. They were changed Both of them would be a miracle, yeah. Enough to actually become a different kind of person I agree. that would share. Exactly. So, anyway. It, it would be a miracle if people shared that kind of radical uh, generosity. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, radical generosity is a pretty a strong miracle. And, yeah. But the text of John and then the synoptics, they, they want to see it as a kind of a, a reenactment of Moses providing manna, et cetera. Okay. So now the rest of chapter six is astonishing because it, it's about this miracle and what it meant. And what Jesus is going to do is say, you guys saw it as a way to fill your stomachs and maybe to use me to be your king and do your bidding. But wait, let me tell you what it's about. He said, the manna that Moses gave the children of Israel, when they ate it, all of them died, with the exception of uh, Joshua and Caleb. You know, two recipients of manna only went into the promised land, right? Two out of what the text says is 600,000. The odds are minute, right? Jesus says, you would be like the children of Israel. You'd eat that stuff, but you'd still die. Then he reinterprets the bread. He didn't do the fish, by the way. I've often thought this was a, a disappointing moment. But uh, in, in the early part of the church's life through the third century, it was very common to have fish during communion. Yeah, very common. Anyway, uh, why? Well, here it is. John didn't have a Last Supper, right? This is his view of communion, I think. So the rest of the chapter is this. What did that miracle mean? And, and Jesus will keep saying to people, you have got to see that I am the bread of heaven and I am the source of eternal life. And if you see that miracle that way, you're, you're getting close to what I meant. But if you just see it, as food to satisfy your hunger and as a means to make me king, then you, you've missed the point. So he, here's the irony of chapter six. Jesus does a miracle and then argues to the rest of the chapter, none of you got it, <laughs> literally. And then he keeps upping the ante to start interpreting the bread and, of course, he doesn't give out wine. Did you notice that? I mean, if there had been wine, my God, 5,000 people, you know, <laughs> had their fill. You know? <laughs> oh, wow, what a party, you know. You know he, he does fish and he does bread. But then he starts interpreting. Then you know he's talking about Eucharist. He's talking about Eucharist because he then starts talking about bread of heaven and my blood. Now, before people start throwing up and uh, that sort of thing, Remember, Jesus is a good Jew. I am convinced that Jesus never ate non-kosher food. I'm convinced Paul did. And Peter had a hard time with it. Is what it okay. So Jesus is an observant Jew. And if he were to be speaking literally, what is he saying? Listen, y'all carve up my flesh and have some flesh. Would you take it right off the, maybe off my thigh? Anyway, uh, and let me... Uh, puncture my veins here and I'm going to have my blood. It's just unthinkable that that's what Jesus is saying in this chapter. And I'll show you a verse later. So Jesus now takes this fish and bread multiplication story and starts talking about, I am the bread of heaven. You must eat my flesh. I am uh, the blood that gives you life. Right? And every person there who's a Jew is saying to themselves, well, I know we can't do cannibalism and I know we can't drink blood. I mean, one of the things about sacrificing an animal is you turn it upside down so all the blood 
Uh, if any of y'all been to Scotland and had a nice bowl of haggis, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't either. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so blood forbidden, and of course, cannibalism. Uh, you know, as, as I, so when the people hear that, they like throughout John, they do what? They take it literally. They take it literally. What well, you're saying? You want us to eat your flesh and drink your blood? Well, good gravy. What kind of Jew are you? You know, that sort of thing. And so Jesus realizes that this is a hard saying. And go down to verse uh, 30, uh, 58. And he says this. Um, this then is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate, but then later died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. And Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. So clearly, when Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven, it's a metaphorical statement. When he says, uh, drink my blood, it, it's a metaphorical statement. When he says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus is not a shepherd. Never was a shepherd, right? It's all metaphorical. And why do we know that? Well, at the very end of this chapter, uh, it says this, a verse, uh, this is verse 60. Many of his followers heard this and said, this teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? And without being told, Jesus knew that they were grumbling about him. Who does this make you want to give up? Suppose then that you see the son of man, etc. Okay, so at this point, because so many people do hear it literally, they start drifting away. At the end of the chapter, you get the impression that the only people who's left are his 12. You know, and, and this is the Capernaum synagogue. And Jesus uh, says to them, um, look at verse, uh, verse, I'm looking at 66. Because of this, many of Jesus' followers turned back and would not go with him. So he asked the 12 disciples and you, would you also like to leave? And then Peter does this. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And now we believe and know that you are the Holy One who has come from God. So at the end of this long dispute, the only folks who are sort of with Jesus apparently are his disciples. But then John adds at the end, of course, one of his disciples was a fraud and Judas, you know, so 11. <laughs> There's 11 left, right? Okay, why do I think that Jesus is speaking metaphorically? Well, look, here's the verse that I have always kind of pointed to. He says this, look at verse uh, 63. What gives life is God's spirit. Human power is of no use at all. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit. Uh, this is saying, look, it's not flesh that's going to give you life. It's not blood, not literal blood that's going to give you life. It's the spirit that works through these human means to give you uh, life. And, and when people argue about the meaning of the Eucharist, this chapter is at stake, always at stake. And when I think in the Reformed tradition, the Presbyterian tradition, we say, no, it's not that the bread and the cup we drink literally turns into the actual body of Christ or the actual blood of Christ. That's called transubstantiation in, uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition. No, we say it's the spirit that's moving through that bread and that cup that gives you life. Otherwise, you're making an assertion about something that a Jew would never consider. I mean, flesh, human flesh and human blood. It, it's unthinkable <laughs> that a Jewish person would ever suggest that to another person at all. And the word idea comes up again. The, the what now? The word thing comes up. Word became flesh. Yeah. So Jesus is trying, again, in the Gospel of John, here's, here's the standard setup. Jesus does a sign. 
Certain people completely misconstrue it, misunderstand it completely. Jesus often has to step back and sort of reinterpret what he did to help them see. And there's a division. Some will get it and, and, and some will not. Right. And I'd like to say that, you know, so much of what happens in the church, honestly, is our taking a look at what Jesus did, trying to interpret what it meant, and then seeing if it'll make an impact in people's lives. And if they'll see it for what it really is as spirit and life, or as Jesus would say, eternal life. John 6 is a complicated chapter, but at the very end, think about it. It starts with 5,000 people eating their full, wanting to make it king. Jesus disappears from them, won't, won't you know, kind of interact with them. They catch up with him in Capernaum, and they press him, and then he reinterprets it in such a way that they're put off. Why? Because they're taking literally what he's saying about blood and flesh. And Jesus said, no, it's not about blood. It's about spirit that's being uh, mediated through this cup and this bread that makes it the bread of heaven, the cup of salvation, not because it literally is. By the way, uh, when I studied uh, medieval church history, there was a dispute, I'm not making this up, where uh, one of the priests was consecrating the bread and, and, he, and he broke the bread, you know, and some of the bread fell uh, on the ground and some mice ate it before he, you know, could sweep it up. And so the question became, well, are those mice Christian? But but you see how that can become literalized, you know, and it became wow. It's it's at the heart, by the way, of the Reformation. It's one of the reasons Luther said we just can't do this anymore. You know, this this transubstation is a kind of literalism about the bread and the cup that clearly is not indicated in chapter six. And why? Because after people don't understand flesh and blood, literally, Jesus says, it's not that at all. It's the spirit that gives life. I, you, I, I carve off a little off my elbow and give you some veins to drink out of. That ain't going to do it. That's not going to get you eternal life. It's spirit. And by the way, um, this is this chapter probably is one of the most controverted chapters in all the Gospels in terms of what it's supposed to be. Well, what do y'all think, gang? Tell me what you're thinking. It seems kind of confusing, Frank. Go ahead, Peter. What'd you say? Lane, what'd you say, Lane? <laughs> I'm confused. What's that? Well, uh, I guess one of the questions is why make it this complicated? That's always my question. Always <laughs> my question. Bruce is on with you. Don't you? <laughs> Bruce is with you. Uh, well, I think that honestly the signs were complicated. I mean, they, they weren't just, if they were self authenticating, and oh well, look there it is you know there, there's bread from heaven this but but the point I think John's making is, is that signs themselves are ambiguous that that's and I so it's not me trying to make it complicated I think it's John trying to analyze why people didn't get it well Frank let me let me present a, a different hypothesis a little right. bit but. I think what we have with John is a man who is writing after, of course, the life of Christ, after the preaching of Paul, yeah. and after the Christian church has developed certain practices and beliefs in different places, yeah. not all of which are consistent. And he's trying to, in a sense, do his own reformation of the faith by 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 telling a story from his perspective and point of view. Yeah. 
But with all of those layers, it makes it complicated. Yes, it does. And let's, let's do one further complication lane, which I haven't done said anything about. But this is a book that I use when I teach Jesus in the gospel. This is called the Synopsis of the Four Gospels. And it lays out the gospels along with John. And when you do a comparison and contrast of the Johannine telling of the story and the synoptic story, uh, they're in the same ballpark, but uh, they really are quite different, you know. So part of the complication line is each gospel writer has a particular tale they want to tell and an emphasis they want to have, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, for instance, when you look at the... Uh, synoptic telling of the story uh jesus doesn't end up uh if i can say this berating the the very people he just fed <laughs> i mean think about it the way john tells it jesus is so put off by the folks he's just fed he says look i'm not going to be your king and you just wanted by you know the, the the food and fish that i gave that i gave you know but I am now going to tell you what it meant. And he puts them off at the end of chapter six. Who's left? 12 followers. 12. So talk about a, a, a sign that didn't uh, create mass belief. It actually created mass disbelief. <laughs> it's nuts. And by the way, Lane, the synoptics don't even tell that tale. That's John's telling. Of this story. So here it is. The two miracles you find in all four Gospels, the resurrection and the feeding, would suggest that only with those with eyes to see would, would see it for what it is. And the vast majority of folks do what? This is too hard to say. Or to go to the resurrection, this is an idle tale. So hey, wouldn't it be nice, honestly, if I could go and do a miracle here on top of the, the steeple of, of First Presbyterian Church so that the whole city of Albuquerque would believe? Let's see, what could I do? Could I jump off the steeple? What about, you know, angels carry me down? Would that work? <laughs> I'm, I'm being ridiculous, you know. I mean, it would get you in the hospital, Frank. Yeah, I put it in the hospital. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so y'all, if, if miracles, if miracles are self-authenticating, then the question becomes, why is it they're so ambiguous? You know, and the, the by, by the way, the great example of this is, of course, Pharaoh who sees 10 gigantic miracles and still ends up on the bottom of the Red Sea. Right. So, Frank, I have a question sure. um, about uh, the doctrine of election in verse 44. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Verse 44? Let me see here. Uh, yeah. No one can come to me unless the Father who, is, uh, uh, who sent me draws him to me, and I will raise him to life on the last day. You know, the Gospel of John. Well, what is your question exactly? Well, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on. Okay. Well, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus says, uh, I, I, when I'm lifted up, will draw all people to myself. In the Gospel of John, what draws people to Jesus, finally, is the cross, which is his throne. And that's what draws people. And in John, Jesus seems to say it's the Father who, who is drawing people to understand that. And it really raises an interesting question of why is it that some get it and don't? In, in, in that verse, it seems to be the answer, well, because the Father drew them, you know. And it raises the question of what engenders belief. At least in the Gospel of John, this is the work of God that anybody believes. It's not self-engendered faith. It's a work of God. And uh, of course, Calvin and Luther and all those in the Reformed tradition just uh, beat up on those verses and said, look, it can't be works. It can't be stuff we 
did or um, so only God so they end up both Calvin and Luther being predestinary you know that God chose you and you believe because God chose you if you don't believe well God didn't choose you and that's the side of the coin that the contemporary Luther Presbyterian tradition has rejected in other words it's it's one thing to say that I believe because God drew me to the cross. It's another thing altogether to say, and therefore the opposite side of the coin is also true, that if you don't believe, then God did not choose you, and you're not part of the elect. Well, that question came up earlier today, because we were asking about, well, why was this man saved? Yes. Why yeah. were these? That's right. And it's a, I, what I'm trying to say is, the moment we start trying to explain that, I think we're kind of in murky waters. And Luther and Calvin wanted to explain it so bad that they uh, basically said, well, I am here by grace alone. And therefore, if you're not here in the fellowship, then God did not choose you. And I, that's the side of the coin. I'm not willing to go there because I think at that point, I'm taking the place of God and say, well, by the way, when Calvin uh, talked about preaching, he said, you assume that everyone in the congregation is the elect. I mean, you know, because the moment you start to, well, you know, this person, I, pretty clearly that's not part of the elect. I could see that just by the way. Really? <laughs> you know, really? Can, can you see that? You know, and what I try to say is, it's one thing to say, I've been saved by grace. I've been chosen by God. God has put God's hand upon my shoulder. It's another thing entirely to say the opposite side of that point. That I know or I'm sure God has not chosen you or except that that seems to be, uh, as they say in law, going beyond the evidence. Going way beyond infinite. I thought God chose everyone as those that said yes or okay. And, and part of the Reformed tradition has gone that route to say that God's called us to, God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to the truth, First Timothy. But some people hear that call, but what I'm trying to say is, Jesus does not explain in John 6 why some people don't get it. He just says, those that do get it, the Father is drawn them to me. And so even Jesus refuses to give an explanation for non-belief. And I think we should be very, very cautious. Or to put it a different way, we should be incredibly grateful to God when our hearts are strangely warmed and we are drawn to Christ. It's not my own doing. It is a gift to God, lest we should boast, right? But that, that's a lot of reformed arguments in this one chapter one about the Eucharist and two how people are drawn to Christ but I think it's a huge mistake when people start saying well I know then why the other side of the coin happened that's a mystery that I don't think we, that we should talk to it about, in my opinion and a lot of people want to make simple explanations for it you know and uh, here we go you know the the sins of the world, the devil, the, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, I, 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 oh, oh, yes, dear. I'm really sitting here right now uh -huh. and saying, oh, uh, I don't believe. Right. But then later on down the line, yeah. different circumstances. That's right. And you have a chance to change it up. That's right. Yeah, so you can't say this particular time that this is definitely an opinion That's right. A different understanding. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because uh, you start out as a little kid, you know, you, you pray for that red fire truck at Christmas, and that's what it's all about. Exactly you know? right. Yeah. And a lot of people, quite frankly, never get past that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you 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 develop all all through your life, and you think, you know. And that's uh, that. That kind of goes where where this is going. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, you can be told. You can you can have it explained to you in a 
And it, you're probably going to get that differently than the person who said it or, or whatever. Uh, eventually, that certainly was happening to me. Oh, not me too. I, here's what I would say is that uh, the Christian tradition, I think, says that one conversion is not enough. Uh, there has to be constant reconversions. And by the way, one of the reasons we come to church every Sunday, <laughs> at least I do. Well, okay, I get paid too. But, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. so it's the yeah. bread, right? yeah, it's right. it's <laughs> bread and fish, baby. Bread and fish. But I found that, you know, if I don't constantly pose the question of Jesus to, to myself every day, it, it, it could easily slip away. I mean, it really can. And uh, it can be very discouraging. You know, I think the last year and a half, we've seen people get discouraged in a hundred different ways, you know. And so I think constant reconversion is, is part of this process. I really do. It's one of the reasons I read the Psalms every day. That's kind of true. I'm sorry, I'm still going to get a point no. back to your, your mention of miracles. Yeah. You do not so much do miracles, but you cause miracles every day. We need to be all we all need to be careful what miracles we come because real miracles happen here. Yeah. And and to her point, it may not happen immediately, mm -hmm. but you may have caused a miracle that's gonna show up right. later. Yeah. I agree. And and you know what? Uh, as I get older, I'm open to surprises, you know, to, to how these things come about. Uh, uh, in ways that I could have never predicted whatsoever. Uh, I, I could give you chapter and verse, you know, day by day, there's something new. And so, well, what is it the uh, lamentation says? Uh, fresh each day are thy mercies, you know, new and fresh each day are your mercies. So, so Jesus, okay, final point here. Jesus doesn't give up on the crowd just because they want their flesh, you know, their, their uh, fish and their bread, and they want to make him king. He keeps on at it, and he doesn't end his ministry on six by saying, "I've had it with these people." You know, <laughs> you know he just he just keeps trying. You know, and so part of the image for me is that um, the, the the hound of heaven who keeps on pursuing us again and again and again. All right. All right so next week we're going to look at John seven. And it's a wonderful story of Jesus going back to Jerusalem, because that's what he does with John, and that the dialogue that he has with his uh, opponents. Okay? So let's pray. Good and gracious God, open our eyes to see the marvels and the miracles and the insights you provide each and every day. For our time together, we're grateful. May it uh, bear fruit through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.